Today is Tuesday, September 22nd, 2015. We're interviewing Ronald Baltiera at the Illinois State Library. Mr. Baltiera is 68 years old, having been born on 6-17-47. My name is Amy Joseph. I'll be the interviewer. Jacqueline Getz will be the court reporter. Mr. Baltiera, would you like to begin? Yes. Uh, my name is Ron Baltiera. I was born in Berwyn, Illinois, uh, 19, uh, June 17, 1947. And I was raised by my grandparents, um, uh, Julia and Marcial Baltiera. And uh, they raised me up until uh, I went to Vietnam, <laughs> went to the service. And uh, uh, they, uh, so, um, let me, let me start, let me see here. You can erase some of this if I'm wrong or just continue on going. You're fine. Okay, all right, I am get a little nervous. I got a little messed up here. I went to Revis High School in Burbank, Illinois. And I started off on the varsity wrestling team from my freshman year to my senior year. And I've broken some wrestling records at Revis that are still, uh, are, haven't been broken since. Uh, from there, I was supposed to go to college. I had an opportunity to go to uh, the university, either Iowa State or Michigan. And uh, we had a problem. My parents, my, which were my grandparents, which adopted me when I was five years old, had a problem with a contractor. So they needed some money uh, to uh, get out of the, uh, to, to pay for the contract that had to be done. And my grandparents being as old and retired as they were, uh, I decided I was gonna take off a year of school and uh, work in a factory and help them get over that bill. Well, that had turned out to be two years of work in midnights at a, uh, a factory in Berwyn, Illinois. And at that time, all my friends that I graduated from high school with uh, either went on to college, uh, went into the Navy, got drafted, uh, or wherever they went. And, uh, you know, I waited, uh, Finally, my second year out of high school and everybody's gone, I went to the recruiting office and I says, my name is Ron Baltier. Is there any reason why I'm not, you know, looked at to be drafted or whatever? I says, you know, everybody's gone but me. I'm home alone. I worked midnights. I had no idea what Vietnam was all about because I worked midnights. 30 days later, I got a letter from the government, from Uncle Sam saying greetings. I ended up in the Army, that's how I got in. I went to Fort Hood, Texas. I did my basics. I went to uh, uh, Fort uh, Pope, Louisiana, where I did my advanced infantry training. I got 30 days off. I went home and I got engaged to a girl I was dating for four years. And I felt that, okay, this was no big deal. I was coming home. I didn't know anything about the war, even though I was going through training. They kept talking about the VC. They kept talking about booby trips. They kept talking about how this war was taking so many lives. I just wasn't paying attention to it at that time. I constantly worked out morning, noon, and night. I was just trying to stay in shape because it was still the scholarship I was looking for. And uh, I ended up going to now. So here we are, um, we're, we're in the air. And uh, uh, there was an old timer, an old timer, what I mean, this guy was his second tour. He might have been 21, 22, he wasn't really that old, but they consider those guys old timers. We were flying back from, uh, or rather we were going from uh, Ford, where do we go? I can't remember how, what flight it was. All I remember was O'Hare to Fort Ord, I believe, and Fort Ord to Vietnam. And uh, when we got, when we started to land, the, uh, the plane, all of a sudden, it looked as if it was, boom, just turned, it, it had a reverse coming, it, it was coming down to the landing field, and then all of a sudden, everybody fell back in their chairs because now it started to go skyrocket into the sky, and uh, we, nobody had any idea what was going on. I thought this was just a bad operator, huh? and then the, the lifer on board says, guys, take a look outside the window, so we looked out the window, and it looked like somebody's dropping pebbles and a real soft dust and a little cloud was puffing up. And we asked him, we said, wow, what's going on? What's that? He said, well, the mortar in the airfield. Uh oh, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I don't know if they taught me any of this here. So anyways, they said, all right, prepare yourself. So they said, the minute we land, he said, grab your duffel bag and we gotta be out of this plane in minutes. 
and we had 360 some people I believe so we landed in between bunkers and I tell you we unloaded that plane that felt like we unloaded it in less than a minute and a half it was unbelievable the way we ran and from there we ran from the plane to a bunker that was my experience of what year was that when there was went? 19 there was August of 1968 and uh, I said whoa this is the way it is here I had no idea so then they, they that night we were in uh, uh, Bearcat. I was in Bearcat for about a week uh, because I guess they were trying to find out where to send us. You know, we had 360 some people and they were just sending them wherever men were needed. And uh, all I remember is watching John Wayne movies for the last three or four days, the Green Beret. And I'm saying, wow, this is, you know, I'm looking at a Vietnamese, a Vietnam movie with John Wayne in it. And I'm actually in the middle of it. I said, this is a real deal here, and I'm watching it on TV, and that looks scary. And I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, this is unbelievable. So I was on CQ that night, and uh, all I remember now, there was, I had no idea what rockets were. I had no idea what uh, mortars were. I knew what they were, but I never witnessed them. And we got mortared that night when they had me on CQ. CQ it means I was in the office doing paperwork, cleaning, whatnot, just to help, just to do something. And I was, they volunteered me to do that. So we started getting murdered. And the guy in charge says, all right, tell everyone to hit the bunkers. I had no idea. I didn't have to tell anybody anything. Once the mortars come in, hit those 10 roofs, everybody automatically knew how to run out of the barracks into the bunker. And I'm running down the street screaming at everybody, get in the bunkers, we're getting murdered. And mortars are coming in while I'm running down the street. <laughs> And I remember this black guy come jumping out of the bunker and he grabs me by the collar and drags me inside. He says, hey, son, you know, we, we know we're getting murdered. I said, oh, my God, again, that was experience. So now I finally get to my base camp. And uh, I, I remember that they assigned me to 3rd Platoon. And they said, okay, you're going to be with 3rd Platoon. But 3rd Platoon didn't have a platoon leader. It didn't even have a platoon sergeant. We were short. It was constantly short all the time. Because men, there were turnovers, either getting wounded, getting shot, getting killed, or getting home early or leaving or whatnot. But anyway, it was a constant big turnover. We never had a full amount of men that we were supposed to have. Like a platoon should have had 28 plus. A squad should have had 8 to 10 plus, And we didn't have any of that. We're lucky to have 18 and 4 and 5 per squad. So that's the reason why we had so much of a turnover. So I, they assigned me to second platoon. And second platoon, I walked in there with my duffel bag, my M16, my steel helmet, and my flak jacket. And I walked up to the lieutenant, and I said, sir, I'm here reporting to you. And he says, okay. He said, get ready. We're going out on patrol. And I says, oh, wow, this is exciting. I says, okay. I says, what do I do? He says, where do I put my stuff? He says, anywhere you want. Just go lay your, your stuff down. So I laid my duffel bag down. And they were in a hurry. They were ready to go. And I still wasn't. On, you know, uh, I still had a lot of stuff to do before. I was ready to hit the field because I didn't have any ammunition. I didn't have all, all I had was a rifle, no ammunition, no pouches, uh, no hand grenades or whatever it is that they hand you as a, as a new recruit. So he, the lieutenant puts his, uh, his shoulder to me and he looked over to another guy. His name was Williams. He was from Missouri. He says, hey, Williams, he says, uh, this guy's new and William, redheaded. Big white guy puts his arm on me. He says, that's right, I'll take care of him. And he says, I'm going to take care of you, son. Right away, I'm the little guy. I'm, 20, <laughs> I'm 21 years old. And I think he was only 18 or 19. Aww. And now he's going to take care of me because he was already in the field five or six months. So I says, okay. I says, thanks. I said, no, this is nice. So the lieutenant rushed back and said, you know what, forget it. You stay here. We're going out. So the, the whole platoon went out, and I stayed behind with another guy. It was right in his... Uh, it was right in his wife. I guess she was cheating on him with, her, with his brother, and you know he was all talking to himself and screaming and yelling while I'm trying to watch TV. You know, and I'm thinking, and he's all upset. I'm thinking, wow, what's going on here? You know. So I was sleeping, and I finally fell asleep around 12 o'clock at night. Then the sirens went off, and they said, okay, somebody come running in and said, mount up, we got to go out. Third, second platoon just got hit. That was the squad that I was supposed to be with which I didn't know at that time. So I jump on 3rd Platoon's uh, uh, squad, and I'm up drive, riding with them out to the rice paddies where this incident happened, and it was right near a river where the tides go up and down. Well, what happened was these guys surrounded this little hooch, a little house, and they knew that the enemy was 
traveling up and down this stream. Well, at low tide, that was low, where you couldn't see nothing, you didn't see the enemy. And at high tide, when it came up, they ambushed the Americans and they killed all of them. So we got out there. There was about maybe six or seven that were killed. It was a squad, second platoon. So when we got out there, uh, I remember sitting on top of the track, and uh, there was a guy in, in, in the rice paddies. He was waving a uh, M60 barrel. I guess he was a 60 gunner, but all he had was just a barrel he was waving. I, there could have been one survivor, or this guy could have came from. I have no idea how that man was waving. And all the other people were all dead. But anyway, he was waving his barrel, 60-gun barrel. And finally, we went out there and retrieved him. And then we were standing in front of the hooch that got hit. And uh, we dismounted from our APCs, armor personnel carriers, got down, walked over to the area that was ambushed. And they had a guy tied up to a, the side of a hooch. And the bullet holes, they just annihilated them. They, they mutilated them. And they had another guy laying on the ground. I just remember these two guys, and he was staked to the ground. And I looked at him, and I looked at his name tag. That was that, that Williams that put his arm around me and said he was going to take care of me. And I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, what is this? So then that same day, there was, a, uh, there was another hooch not too far away. We all went to that hooch, and there were some GIs that were inside a bunker, and each little Hooch in Vietnam, the people, the villagers, they had bunkers because there was uh, the war had to be going on for hundreds of years. At least it seems like it. So everyone had like a little bunker in, in their in their house, and uh, I they were looking. The colonel was there, the radio battalion radio operator was there. I remember those two guys plainly. And uh, when I walked up just to look, I was curious, and uh, all I saw the colonel turn around and say, "Okay, son, take off your my gear." He says, and they tied a rope around my waist, gave me a 45 and a flashlight, and wanted me to go into a bunker. At that time, somebody just walked out of the bunker. So I said, oh, okay, so it's pretty safe. Why are they still giving me a gun and a, and, and, a, and a flashlight? So I go crawling through the bunker, and it wasn't that big, but uh, I'm crawling. as I'm crawling through it, I smell things that I'd never smelled before. Uh, I smell fetus, I smell urine, I smell blood, I smell flesh, I smell all that was combined into one. What happened was two GIs ran in there. The VC got in there and they threw hand grenades in there and they mutilated the body. The body just went in there, millions of pieces. So I went in there to retrieve them. We weren't, nobody knew that was in there. Nobody knew what was going on at that time. So I crawl in there and I'm stepping over flesh and I couldn't hold the light and I couldn't walk at the same time. I couldn't hold a 45, excuse me, as I was crawling through. Finally, I put the flashlight in there, and they're screaming at me on the outside. They said, how many bodies are in there? How many are in there? And, you know, I was already, wasn't acting normal as it was with the flashlight. I couldn't control the light. All I remember was seeing, smelling, flesh, and, and all this other stuff. Finally, I focused the light down at the bottom as I made myself all the way. I, I finally came. We went through the side, and I came through the main entrance where everybody, where those two bodies were at, and I spotted two heads, two skulls. But they looked normal. It looked like there was nothing wrong with them. You know, they were just hand grenades and pieces. Of, you know, I didn't know they. I didn't even realize they were dead. So the first guy I tied up. He says, "They're in there. Tie him up." So I tied the guy's ankle up, and they started pulling on him. His foot fell off. And I'm thinking, "Oh my God!" And that just so happened. I happened to be in the line where they were pulling the rope. And uh, instead of jumping over to the other side where I would be clear, I'm standing there helping pull the rope around, pulling it around me. And after the leg fell off or the foot fell off, I just said, forget this. I jumped over to the other side. I got a little better view. And I'm sitting, I'm screaming now while I'm in there. I say, hey, hey, anybody alive in here? And I'm talking to these people. So finally, we, I tied them around the waist. They dragged him out. He was, he was dead. And then the second one, I'm looking, I'm checking out. What could I tie this guy to? So I put the rope around his neck. So they start pulling him out. And they're, they're yelling, how many more? And I said, I got one more. And he's pulling, as they're pulling him out, he got finally, daylight hit him, and they saw the rope around his neck, and, well, they called me every name you could think of, screaming and yelling and carrying out. What the hell's the matter with you? Tying him up like this. And when they pulled the rest of his body from his chest down, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. It was just, he was completely gone. And that's when they stopped screaming. After that, I looked around. I, I got out. I couldn't take it anymore. 
And I walked out and the colonel, they handed me a shovel. They said, hey, threw it in a plastic bag, put the rest of the remains in a, a body bag. I said, oh man, I, I don't even remember saying anything. I just walked off. I, I was done. I wasn't going to do it anymore. And that was my experience. My first time ever seeing anybody dead. And uh, from there, uh, uh, our, we finally got a, a platoon leader, finally got a, uh, a platoon sergeant. And they made me a point man. So, you know, I was there less than a week. They made me a point man. So I figured a point man, wow, this is a hell of a job, man. They recognized me already. They don't even know me. I know I was good at basic and AIT when I was doing my physical training because I always wanted to be number one. So now they're making me number one as a point man. And I had no idea. A point man is either the first one to go, first one to step in a booby trap, the first one. Anyways, you're the first. Oh, my God. I tell you, I got... In less than a week, I knew all about Vietnam. I knew all about the enemy. I knew everything. I was well trained also by a guy that was a point man for months. And he was constantly watching me. He was on my back all the time, making sure I did right. And uh, he liked me because I was a go-getter. I was constantly on the go and making people laugh and joking and wrestling. I wrestled with everybody in basic, I mean, in, in, in the platoon. <laughs> we had a good time. So I did that for a while. My eyes start to water here. Excuse me. Hmm. So I did that uh, for a while, and uh, I got to be good friends with the lieutenant. And since I was an athlete, I believe the lieutenant was an athlete as well, and he'd see me working out all the time, and he asked me if he didn't mind if he joined me. I said, no, come on. So I've got a lot of pictures of him working out with me, and we had a great time. It was a good time. So he finally, uh, after making me a point man, he saw that I did him justice, and uh, a 50-gunner's position opened up. And he says, hey, Ryan, you want the 50-gun? I said, yeah, I'm standing on top of the track. I didn't think anything of it. I, went out. I was sitting on top of the APC when he offered it to me. And there was another guy next to me. That we called him Pancho. He was about six foot five, the tallest Mexican I ever seen. <laughs> and he said, no, I want it. So I jumped in, and he grabbed me to try to pull me out. And he, I, the people down at the bottom started laughing. They said it looked like a chihuahua on a great day. <laughs> I wasn't going to let him go. I said, I got it. He told me first, I'm staying, and that's it. All right, you can have it. So he let go. So I was a 50 gunner for about a, hmm, about a month, and then I witnessed, uh, you know, that's not too good of a job either. People would give the right arm to do that job because, first of all, being uh, a 50 gunner, you're on, you're on an armored personnel carrier, and uh, you never have to go to the field. You're always on that track. Uh, you don't have one at range, you can cover yourself up with a poncho. Uh, you got sleeping quarters inside or in, sitting in your chair. It was a nice, clean job. The only bad thing about it was that, you know, you, get, you hit a mine, 500-pound mine, anybody, including yourself or whoever's on that track with you, are going to die because you're going 30 feet in the air before you come down crashing to Mother Earth. Uh, and then he says, uh, the other one was... Uh, uh, you had to keep it clean, and there was a lot of mud during the rainy season. So you have to keep it clean. You got to keep the beer stacked. You got to keep the soda stacked. You got to make sure you got water. You got to make sure all the sea rations are there. It's like a Susie homemaker, man. I'm thinking, <laughs> hey, I don't know if I like this job. Yeah, this is too much. And, I, and finally, one time I was out on patrol in our platoon. We were watching this village, and a little kid comes by. I'm on top of the 50 gun because I'm. Facing, say I'm facing east, got another gun facing west, south, north, whatever. It's, so I'm facing, a little kid comes by with a basket, and he says, uh, hey, GI, soda beer, soda beer, and I'm on guard. And somebody gives me a duty, I'm going to stick to it, I'm not going to change it. I said, no, no beer. I said, no, baby son, we call him baby son, little kid. No, baby son. He walks further down, and he goes to these arvins. These arvins were sitting around this little fire pit. And they were just sitting there, and the kid walks up to him and went in the yard, and I don't know what they said. They gave him money for the drink, and then, boom, there was a big explosion. In that basket, the VC put a hand grenade down at the bottom of it. So anybody grabs a soda or beer or whatnot, it's going to blow up. So after that happened, turn the tracks on, the RPC, no, they start running, and everybody grabs the 50, and, you know, there's all, all four of us 50 gunners grabbing, and we don't know what to expect, you know, we seen a big explosion over here, which was a hand grenade, and everybody's on a little bit frenzy, we went frenzy, man, we're on alert. All of a sudden, here comes this mama son coming, running right past me, and I looked down, I didn't know what, what this was all about, why she did that. She's going running, screaming past me, and goes running up to where those arms got blown up, 
And as she walked up to that fire pit, she fell to her knees and she started screaming and crying and she pulls her blouse up and she's taking the little boy's body parts and sticking it inside her blouse, pulling it all together. Here comes an Arvin. One of the, Arvin is a uh, uh, South Vietnamese a regular, like we the army, and they're like the army. And grabs his wooden uh, rifle and I hit her right in the side of the head and he put a gash. I mean, her face just opened up from hitting her with the rifle. You know, because first of all, her son killed his friends. So this Arvid hit her, and man, he just kept hitting her, hitting her. The GI finally jumped in and said, hey, hey, what are you doing, man? Stop, stop. So he grabbed the Arvid, and he stopped him from hitting him. And they were screaming and arguing. It looked like we were going to fight with the Arvids, because the Arvids wanted to kill this woman. So a woman, after she finally able to get herself up, she grabs her son's shirt, and she pulls out of the pocket a $5, uh, MPC, whatever they call that, military. In other words, the VC gave the kid five bucks to go deliver this, and the, B, and the kid never knew there was a bomb in there. So after that, I says, I'm out of here. I can't take this. All my friends are all around marching you know, on guard, looking here, looking here. And for me to be in stationary in one place, I just couldn't do it. So I asked, the, I asked Pancho that him and I almost killed each other over. I says, hey, Pancho, man, I says, uh, you can have the job you want. Says, Hell no, I don't want that job. I said, all right. So I gave, looked at another guy. You went, boom, that guy jumped up and got in the gun seat. And he said, oh, I love it. I want it. He stayed there ever since. So now I'm back on the ground again. I'm back in the field. I'm back walking around in the rain. I'm sleeping out there with the leeches. The, the scorp you know, they had scorpions. They had snakes. They had, they had all these wild life that you see in that type of a climate. So we did that. And after that, the... Uh, Lieutenant, we went out on a patrol, Lieutenant and the Captain, it was a company sweep, a Bravo company sweep. And uh, the, comp the Captain was to my right flank, and we were on the left with the Lieutenant. And we're walking and there was a fence laying over a rice paddy dike with a hand grenade on the end of it. I knew what a booby trap was. The beginning, the first two squads walked right over that fence, and on my third squad, I come walking right up to the fence and I stopped everybody, I says, hey, there's a booby trap. And Lieutenant says, well, if it didn't go up, that means it's, it's, it's dead. It doesn't work. So we continued. And no sooner I said that, we heard a loud explosion to our right. The captain was there and his radio operator. My story I got was that we were all marching. There was a tree with a sign on there and saying, F-U-G-I. So the radio operator, along with the captain, walks up to the sign. He rips it down. and ripped it down. There was a booby trap behind there. Boom! Killed him and wiped out about two or three other people around him, including my captain, Bravo Company commander. And uh, I thought he was through, but he didn't. He came back. I says, oh, my God. So after that, the captain came back, and now he needed a radio operator. And the radio operator he had was trained, was state trained. You know, you, sometimes you'll get trained in the field, but this guy was state trained. So he comes up to uh, our lieutenant. Our lieutenant had a radio operator that was state trained as well. So he walks up to me and says, hey, lieutenant, I need your radio operator. I don't have one. So lieutenant is going to say anything. Sure, fine, you got it. Now lieutenant looks at me because we used to work out a little bit, not all the time. And he says, Ron, I'm looking for a radio operator. I said, I said well, who are you looking for? And I'm saying, we got 30 guys to pick from. At that time, might have been maybe 21 guys or 25 guys. And he says, he's staring at me. He says, uh, we're looking for a... Somebody that's got good communications, someone that knows how to handle himself during crisis, someone that's not afraid and he's staring at me and I'm looking over his shoulder and I'm trying to figure, who's he talking about, man? And I'm looking over there. Finally, he says, uh, Ronnie says, uh, I need a radio operator. I know, I know sir, but I, I didn't want to give him any names because I know how dangerous it was being a radio operator because you're walking around with an antenna sticking out over your head. And if the enemy knocks the, the head off the snake, what does it tell you about the body? It goes every which way but loose. So I'm thinking, oh, okay. So I didn't know, I couldn't think of anybody, didn't want to jeopardize anybody, didn't want to point anybody out. And he says, Ryan, I'm looking for a radio operator. I thought, oh, who? <laughs> Me? He says, yeah, here I am. Now I became his radio operator. But before I became his radio operator, I was grabbing hand grenades and throwing them in bunkers. Every time somebody spotted a bunker, I was throwing a hand grenade down in there. 
Then, I, you know, people would say, hey, over here, we got another one. I run up to it with a hand grenade, open it up, wait five seconds, throw it down in there. And, hey, we spot another one. All this time I was doing that, he decides to make me a radio operator. So now here I am, I'm wearing a radio. And he's talking on the phone. And then he hangs up, and he hangs up, somebody says, hey, we got one over here. I go running over there. And I got the radio on my back, and I'm throwing hand grenades down in these bunkers. The lieutenant is saying, hey, come on now. You got to stick by me. I said, I'm the main guy. I go, okay, hey, we got another one. So I go running over there and throw another hand grenade in that bunker. Finally, the lieutenant tells his driver. He whispers to him. I don't know what he said, though. The driver goes to the track, the RPC, the, the R, uh, uh, APC, Armored Personnel Carrier, and then he comes back to the lieutenant. And the lieutenant says, hey, I need the radio. So I go running up to the lieutenant. He said, turn around. So I turn around, and I feel him messing with my belt. And I didn't know what he was doing. So then after that, he pretends like he's talking. Well, he was talking. I heard him talking. Then he hangs up. He hangs up kind of hard to let me know that he's done talking. So after he, then someone else screams out, hey, over here, we got another one. <laughs> another bunker. Man, I took off. I started running. Kaboom! All of a sudden. <laughs> He put an eight-foot rope on the front of his belt and the back of my belt. My feet come flying out from under me. I hit the ground, and I get back up, and everybody's cracking up. Here we are in the middle of a battlefield, and, you know, we're blowing up all these bunkers, and then now he's everybody's cracking up that I landed on my seat. <laughs> oh, that's the only way he controlled me. After that, I never ran away from him. I was by his side. Well, a couple months later, he's out. I'm his radio operator. A couple of months later, uh, we're driving down. Uh, uh, we went into a village, and our, the track in front of us hit a mine, hit a 500-pound mine. The 500-pound mine, the reason why I know that the track weighing close to 10 tons or maybe more would go 30 feet in the air, and anybody sitting on top of it just went flying everywhere. And some survived, some didn't. Well, if you were on hard ground and concrete or on asphalt, you didn't survive. If you were in the rice paddies and you land in the mud and land in the rain, there's a possibility you're going to survive. Well, this one here hit a mine. And uh, the lieutenant, uh, the track flipped over into the rice paddy, and there was a guy underneath it that got wedged from the APC. And he was about, mm, I would say, the rice paddy and water was maybe two feet high. And he was, he was, cat, he was smashed from his legs down, so he couldn't get his mouth up there to breathe. He only had maybe a, not even an inch to try to breathe. So people caught it when they saw his hands waving and swinging and everything else. But uh, we, everyone went out there tried to lift the track up to flip it over to get him out. That couldn't do it. Guys were trying to dig out the mud from underneath him. The track had him really wedged into the ground. And other guys had helmets, and they were putting it over his face to give him air. And then removing the helmet, get another one, give him air, give him air, give him air. And finally, I believe he died. He just finally yielded less than an inch of clearance. And he passed. So... One of the guys that was in the rice in the rice paddy next to the track pulls up a wire, and the wire runs right to the corner of the of a dike. And when it did that, this VC jumped up and he just started running. So we knew he was the one that detonated because this was manually detonated now. So he started running. My lieutenant spots him. He was the first one to spot him, and he starts running. He says, "Hey, there he is! There he is! Look, he's over there! He's running with a hope to him." We don't really know what's going on. We're still confused. You know, you got people that are got it together that are doing what they're supposed to do, trying to save this life, trying to get this guy out of there. And you got other guys that are pulling security, and, you know, looking around. And then the lieutenant spots him, the lieutenant running. And you got a brand new recruit that we got from stateside. The reason why I know he was new, he had dark green fatigues and spit shine boots. He's got a 79 grenade launcher. The lieutenant's pointing as he's running. The new recruit saw him. So he grabs the grenade launcher and he's ready to shoot towards where that VC was running, and he fires, and the lieutenant walks right in the front of his, right in front of his barrel. Boom! Hit him right in the ribs. My lieutenant flew up in the air. Again, all I saw was his feet flew up in the air, hit the ground. And I'm standing behind him because I was his radio operator. The round hit him and bounced and hit the ground. This grenade round has to travel at least 150 feet before it explodes, and it's got to hit something solid. Well, it hit his ribs and bounced right off. So I seen that. I'm thinking, oh, my God. 
And to this day, my lieutenant and I, we talk, we laugh, everybody laughs about it. But I couldn't believe he's laid, he sprawled out on the ground. Did it break his ribs? It, it, he said that he didn't get any broken ribs, it just damaged them, you know. He, it's like a good, solid, oh, big round smack on the side of three of his ribs. So I said, Lieutenant, you get a purple heart for that? And he, uh, they didn't get one for it. But he got injured pretty bad. So I thought that was it. I thought they sent him stateside. So here we are now without a lieutenant. So they sent the whole platoon back to base camp. I'm sitting in the NCO club. And this, uh, this guy just walks in from out of nowhere. This guy's wearing real nice dark fatigue pants, uh, not spit shine, but clean boots, handlebar mustache, real clean. We're all muggy, full of mud, you know, smelling bad and, you know, all dirty and everything. He goes to the bartender at the NCO club and he says, hey, where's this guy, Baltier? And the bartender points over to my table. I knew this later that he was asking for me. And he goes over to my table and he's, and I'm sitting there with uh, my squad, Doc Ogden, uh, Beck, uh, I can't remember all of them. Gonzalo, we're all sitting there at the table drinking beer. And he comes walking up to me and he says, uh, is uh, uh, RTO Baltiera here? Man, I covered up my name tag. I don't want to be covered. Well, now what do you want me to do? I just see my lieutenant get zapped. I don't want to go out with no other lieutenant. I don't want to be a radio operator. I don't like the job. <laughs> he turns around and he says, uh, oh, finally Doc Ogden says, yeah, he's right here, pointing me on. I said, Doc, why are you telling me that, man? He said, well, let's see what he's got to offer you. He said, well, I'm a battalion radio operator. I got a couple of weeks left. I'm going home. So I want to offer you the job. I said, offer me the job? Yeah. I said, well, what is it? He says, battalion radio operator. I said, man, I just, I just got out. I don't want to go back. I don't want the job. I said, I don't like the job. He said, I don't think you understand what I'm trying to tell you. I said, what? He says, look at me. I says, yeah. He says, I got... I get three meals a day. I uh, I sleep on a bed with sheets and covers, and I got pillows with sheets and pillowcases. I said, and uh, I, I got a black and white TV in our place that you can watch, and we got a house dog that you can play with it, whatever you. Want. And I'm thinking, man, yeah, something's attached to this right here. It's, well, I'm a battalion radio operator. I had no idea. Still, I couldn't bring to my senses what he was talking about because I just witnessed my lieutenant get zapped. So I says, no, man. I says, I don't know. And I never thought my lieutenant was ever coming back. So he says, not only that, uh, he says, when we got Hooch Girl to clean up your barracks. Oh, Hooch Girl, man. <laughs> I said, oh, and everybody at the table said, Ron, I'll take that in a minute, man. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll take it. So I took the job. Because Doc Ogden said, you don't take it, I'll take it. And he, there's no way he could have taken it because he was our medic. <laughs> there's no way they're going to give him the job. So I said, all right, I'll, took it. I'll take it. So I took it. So that was my job. So that was my second, uh, 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 what they call, uh, oh, God, I just had it on the tip of my tongue, uh, friendly fire. That was my second friendly fire. The first friendly fire, and I, I, I let it go when I first got to base camp. Uh, our Brent Fook went to a uh, uh, Tan An airstrip to support them, and Tan An airstrip got mortared and rocketed. That's the reason why we were there. And the, and the platoon uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Delta company, I guess the mortar company, shot around. When they shot the round up, instead of it traveling to where they were supposed to hit, they shot it straight up in the air and it came straight down and killed, you know, killed our own people. That was when I told you about my first kill. So that was the first uh, friendly fire. My lieutenant was the second friendly fire. And I says, all right, and I asked the guy, I'm back now to the platoon, to the battalion, uh, RTO. I says, well, why'd you pick me out of everybody? And he says, man, he says, you sound like a miniature Howard Cosell out there. I don't know if you know what Howard Cosell is. Muhammad Ali and Howard yeah. Cosell. So. And he says, wow, I sound like a miniature Howard Cosell. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's how I got the job. So I had the job for about two months. And one night, this night here, really, really, uh, it was something that I couldn't forget. I couldn't tell the story without falling apart. Well, anyways, I was on patrol, always working out, working out my barracks. I opened up a health club while I was a battalion radio wow. operator. I you know, got some really good pictures. And, Everything was looking good. And uh, that night I was working out, finally around 11 o'clock, Charlie Company that went out on patrol called back and said, we spotted the enemy. 
And when you do that, I, everything stops. So you walk up to them and you say, okay, give me your sit rep. Sit rep is tell me what's going on. And then, well, I was getting sit reps every 15 minutes anyways, but I just needed to know now what's going on. Now I'm, I'm concentrating on Charlie Company. So he was giving me a sit reps and uh, I was getting it from all four squ uh, squats. There was four squats with platoon. And one squad spotted a platoon of gooks, they call them. The other three spotted a squad of gooks. And I've only been on the radio for two months. And I got a lifer that got 17 years of experience over me that was, uh, he was, he was my boss. And he was kind of hard to get along with, you know, he, you know, he drank a lot. So uh, he, he I'm, I'm telling him, I says, hey, Sarge, I says, you know, this spot, well, get on the phone. So I got on the phone, I'm talking to him. And they got to a point where now everybody was scared out in the field. Now everybody's starting to get in position. So as they're getting in position, they started whispering more. And their whispering started sounding like they were losing their breath while they were talking. Everybody's getting, so I couldn't hear that well. So I opened up the volumes on all the radios just so I can hear what's going on. And they even got me whispering, you know, because you know, they're whispering, I'm whispering. I'm thinking, oh my God, what, what are you seeing? What's up? Then I run to the map just to double check. Are these guys in the right place? And if they are, where's the enemy coming from? Because we went out there as an ambush team. Any time we went out, it was always for an ambush. So we're supposed to ambush them. In the meantime, I'm looking around thinking, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. Even on the map, it don't look right because these people here should be further down south, further east. Instead, they're over here. They're spotting something over here right before they got to the area where they were supposed to be. And... About 1 o'clock in the morning, this went on for 11, 12, 12.30, finally, everybody in the field are saying, man, if we don't do something right now, then we're going to get hit. So they were now at a point of no return. The platoon leader in charge, the sergeant in charge, they're saying, okay, get ready. We're getting ready. And then after that, the E7, that was my boss, says, oh, go get the colonel. I said, oh, man. So I went on running up to get the colonel. I said, say, sir, he says, we spotted some enemy movement and we're ready to engage. So he jumps up and he's about 10 feet away from the table. And as he's walking, this E7 briefs him in less than 10 steps as to what's going on. The colonel walks up to the table. He's half asleep. He's not really knowing what's going on. And all these people that were out there were at a point of no return. They were going to shoot no matter whether we said it or not. Lieutenant Colonel gets on the on the horn. I, I'm sitting down. He asked for the horn. I gave it to him. He grabbed it and he said, "Open fire." A minute and a half went by, screaming, yelling, carrying on. When the bullets first started going off, I had the speakers blasting. So it felt to me as if it, the room was a little smaller, half this side, maybe from the end of this table to there. It was small. Radio was all around us. The ceiling height was only seven foot. You can hear a mosquito sound like a helicopter in there. That's how quiet it was. And when this firefight started, man, it was so loud. I panicked. I jumped underneath the table because I thought the bullets were hitting me. And they're all standing there watching me. And I'm really, hey, man, I'm here. So I jumped back up again. And uh, after that, somebody in the field says, halt, halt, friendly fire, friendly fire. Oh, my God. Everybody went into a state of shock. We opened up on our own men. Oh. We ended up killing our, one of our squads. So we lost six people within a minute and a half. Oh my gosh. We got three squads that are the U.S. best. Machine guns, handguns, fighting men. They weren't afraid of fearless men. You got three against one. Wiped them out in less than a minute and a half. After that, I said to myself, oh my God. So... Colonel was in shock. E7 was in shock. I was freaked out. Finally, the sirens start going off, and my lieutenant that was there during the day, the one that got hit in the ribs, he come in and he says, Ron, what happened? And I told him what happened. The E7 that became my sniper, he come running in. He says, Ron, what happened? I told him what happened. So now after that, then they says, hey, you know, I sat down, and now we had to get a dust off. We had to get a helicopter out there to get all these people. As they were getting them, they were reading their name tags. 
All they gave me was the first initial, and I knew who they were. And I thought, oh my God, I'm writing it down because I knew who was there, which one was. I knew where they were going, I knew who was going. So that was stressful. That was hard to take. That one was the hardest thing to take. And uh, after that, we had snipers already. Snipers graduated in November. This is in uh, April. This is in January. And I, I turned around and I said to uh, the U7 in charge, I says, I saw a sign up there looking for snipers. I said, I'm joining sniper school. I'm getting out here. I can't handle this job. He said, no, you can't go. It took me too long to train you. You got to stay. I said, no, I'm going. He says, you're not going. You're staying. Well, he kept me another two weeks until we almost got overrun. Our base camp got hit. I'm on patrol. I'm on, I'm on the, it wasn't, I was in my base. I was in my head, in my living quarters. We had a, a living quarters with a tin roof, and then our bunkers were right outside the, the living quarters. You had three, uh, three feet of sandbag all the way around and on top. That's where, you know, we ever got more to this, we can run to it. So we're watching TV, I'm playing with my dog. This is things that were promised to me, you know. I, mean, I thought it was neat. So we're sitting there talking politics about this is the wrong war, we shouldn't be here, this is this is not right. And, you know, and I, I was still dazed a little bit. And right before I went to my my barracks, there was this guy, his name was Barry, Sergeant Barry, that was going home. He had two weeks left in country. He was getting ready to go home. And uh, Barry was going to the bunker, and I'm going to my hooch to watch TV. And I said, Barry, and we all left the NCO club together. I said, say, Barry, I said, why do you sleep in a bunker? He said, that's the safest place in town. I got three feet here, three feet of wall, three feet of roof. He said, that's it. And I only got a little four-inch slot that's four inches high and about two feet wide. That's in case the enemy comes. You just stick your rifle in there and you shoot. Oh, okay. Well, that night we got hit. Mortar came in. The first one hit the perimeter, and the second one, we jumped up. Me and the other two battalion radio operators jumped up, ran into our bunker, and I dove underneath my bunk bed. I grabbed the pillow, because it was loud. I grabbed the pillow, and I put it over my ears, and boom, we got a direct hit. It hit our tin rope, and a piece of shrap metal hit my pillow as I was laying there on the ground. And I went to pull the pillow up. Man, I burned my hand. That's how hot it was. That was shrapnel. I never knew what this was about. I never really felt shrapnel. If I felt it, it hit my pillow. And I tried pulling it out and burned my hand. So we all jumped up. Us battalion radio. Up. And we haven't been in the field. We don't know how long. So nobody knew where our rifles were. We didn't know where our ammunition was. We didn't know where our steel pots were. We didn't know where our black jacket was. Because we never used it. We just went to the radio and back, radio and back. <laughs> so after that, we found it. I went running out into the street, and I had to go to the radio shack because that's where I was trained to operate the radios. I wanted to see what's going on because I got first hand. So I went running out there, and as soon as I got there, all the officers were inside the radio shack. They said, hey, don't worry about it, man. He said, get out of here. Go to the perimeter. Guard the perimeter. We're okay. Action is going on. You hear the, you hear the BC, and you hear the Americans yelling, screaming, BC yelling, screaming on the, out per, on the perimeter of our where we were at, and our Americans screaming, yelling, get over on that side, get to the left, get to the right, and BC, I don't know what they were saying, but they were, everybody was yelling. Well, finally, I go, I left uh, the Radio Shack, we call it the Radio Shack, headquarters, headquarters company, but, uh, uh, communications, and right across the street was the headquarters offices where we, all the officers were, you know, doing paperwork, doing maps and everything. I went running over there to make sure everybody was okay because I was the only one that had any infantry experience because I was in the field five months. So I grabbed my gun to go in there to see if everybody's okay and they were scared to death when I walked in. I said, you guys all right? Yeah, yeah, what's going on? I said, I don't know, man. I said, they, you know, everybody's getting hit. Finally, the siren goes off. When the siren goes off, that means that it's safe enough to run around. But we still had gunfire on the perimeter. Motors weren't coming in, rockets weren't coming Because the minute we saw a rock, we had night scopes. The minute we saw a rocket come in, we could see the direction it was coming in. And we give somebody a coordinates, and boom, we just start nailing with mortars and rockets. And, you know, you got the Cobras coming out with the machine guns. And now all of a sudden, they cut that off. They're not going to try to mortar us anymore because they know once they expose themselves, they're gone. So after I, I ran to headquarters company and these guys are telling me they're okay, I see these two guys carrying a dead body in a plastic bag, and I see a lieutenant in front, the little guy. I should remember his name, but I can't remember his name right now because he was about my height. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was a, a lieutenant. 
he come walking in and I opened the door and he brought the body in, he laid it down and I says, hey, Lieutenant, I says, man, I says, you know, zip that open, let me see who that is. Because I knew everybody at base camp. He goes down, he opens up the bag. That's the guy that was sleeping in the bunker. He was the guy they found, I said, him, where was he? They found him in his hammock. He got a direct shot between that little slot. An RPG went right, Barry, Sergeant Barry. He had less than two weeks left in country. So he went. And that's when I told the guy, the next day I went to work. I told the, I told the uh, E7 in charge, I says, hey, Sergeant, I says, I'm out of here, man. I'm going, to, I'm going to sniper school. He says, you ain't going nowhere. But I mean, you, you use vulgarity. I don't want to use it the way we talked back then. And he's cussing up a storm and yelling at me. I couldn't take it no more. I mean, when I used to work out in there, he was sitting there, he could tick off at me for working out and yelling at him, do your job. I go out, do my job, do this, whatever I had to do. Boom, I'm going back doing push. Do it. And finally, he got tired of yelling at me. So he's watching me work out. And every now and then he'd tell me I was lying. He said, you didn't do 50, you did 49. <laughs> oh, my God, man. But anyway, I told him, I'm out of here. I don't want to be a battalion radio operator no more. I don't want to be a sniper. Because... Uh, Gramps, we called him Gramps. He was 37, I was 21. Everybody else was around 18, 21. And uh, Gramps comes walking in. He says, man, he whispers to me. He throws out a whisper. He says, hey, let's, let's join sniper school. He was an E7. And he was 37, he was 37 years old, 17 years or 18 years in the military. He says, let's join sniper school. He was an expert shooter. He was on a gun range for 17 years, on a rifle range with the military. Only thing I shot was BBs at rats or field mice in my neighborhood, and that was the only thing I used to shoot. So I says, "All right, so I'm, I'm going to join." And this guy wouldn't let me go, and I backed that he settled up against the wall. I said, "Listen, you son of a bitch, you better either let me go, I'm going to beat your ass." He didn't say nothing. He left me alone. The next morning, in front of all the officers, you know, because he had to sign me off. <laughs> he signed me off that night. And in the morning, he comes walking up. He throws his papers at me. And because nobody knew what was going on, the officers, the new change officers coming in to change over the day. I was midnight, they were during the day. What's going on? Because I, I knew everybody. They knew I worked out all the time. They knew I was, they knew me well. I knew everybody. <laughs> and then finally they see this and then he throws me the papers and then just before he walks out the door, he tells me, and if you mess up and you don't qualify, you don't make it, no way in hell you're coming back here. Screaming and yelling at me in front of the officers. So what, I don't want to come back here. <laughs> Oh, he chewed me out like that. It was, it was something that people would give the right arm for. This was a perfect job. So I decided to go back to the field. Now, the thing about it is, I had to qualify as a sniper to go out in the field. If I didn't qualify, I was just going out in the field as a regular grunt like I was in the beginning. I don't know if I liked that much. You know, I don't know if I wanted to go back to that. I wanted to be a sniper because I saw these other two snipers. I saw them since I became a sniper. I mean, a battalion radio operator. From January 15th to March, to, well, it was two months as a battalion radio operator. I had to go to school. School is a 21 day course. To March probably 14th or 15th, I had two months. And I remember these snipers coming in. I remember them walking up to a board with their name on the board. I remember I'd have to go up there and put a notch next to their name, however many kills they got that night. They had a lot of kills. And they come in with documentation showing what they got off the dead body. So those were called confirmed kills. And the lieutenant or the captain, whoever was with them, would write them in either for a medal or if they got something outstanding. And they got silver stars, so they got some big people out there. I, I ended up, well, that's another story. But uh, I wanted to be one of them guys. And you look at them and you look at me, they're 6'5", and I'm 5'3 and a half. And they averaged six to six five. The one that I remember well was six five. He just died five years ago. And uh, you know his partner, he died two month, two weeks out of Vietnam. And enrolled at the University of California and died in a car accident. But uh, that's that's another story. But anyways, uh, I would see them. I was ooh man. I look at these guys. And, wow man, this is something. I, I'd love to be something like. And they had no idea that I volunteered for that. Now I'm going to school. I got a 21-day course in Dongtan. Excuse me. And here I am. I'm shooting. I'm doing everything they tell me because I'm very athletic. 
And when I graduated out of, or not grad, yeah, I guess you could call it, when I graduated out of basic training, I got a sharpshooter's medal. Nowadays, you have to qualify with an expert shooter to be a sniper. If you want to be a sniper, you got to be an expert shooter. I was just a sharpshooter. Man, I wasn't all that great, but now I'm going up against the best. And Gramps, 17 years on a, on a rifle team. And the other partner of mine from Portland, Oregon, he grew up on a farm. All these guys were farm boys, so they knew how to go out and get supper for breakfast or whatever. Not me. <laughs> I wasn't I was a city slicker. The only thing I saw was field mice and BB gun and the field mice. That was it. So I go out there, going to school, learn how to read maps, which I already knew that. I was a battalion radio operator. I knew how to talk on the radio, which I already knew that because I was a radio operator. And uh, the only thing I didn't really know was shooting and communication and telling you all these things about what you got to do. It was very interesting. 21 day class, we were anywhere from 12 to 14 hours a day. Wow. And we got interrupted almost every day. Rockets, mortars, and people sniping at us. We're trying to learn how to kill them and they're not giving us an opportunity to do it. You know, they're messing with our schooling. I'm thinking, oh man, check this out. This is too much. I don't want to know if I want this job. <laughs> Finally, I had to hit a target 900 meters. Everything else I qualified for. Close range, slow, fast, how quick you can load your weapon, how quick you can tear your weapon apart and put it together. It's very important having a clean weapon out there. Uh, all that pertaining to this this weapon, you, they, they said you treat it like it's your wife or it's your mother. You know, you're going to treat it the best you possibly can because if you ever falter and you don't do what you're supposed to do and it jams on you in the middle of an ambush or it jams on you in the middle of a firefight and you being a sniper, that's your livelihood, that's your life. Not only that, if the enemy catches you, they're going to torture you. They're going to really hurt you. And that's what scared us right then and there. You're a sniper. You're taking these guys out at night. When they least expect it. What do you think they're going to do to you when they get you? Whoa, I started thinking, man, we had 46 people volunteer and just talking. Man, they just started disappearing, man. I'm out of here, man. You can get me out there. And it's a two man team, just two snipers. Nowadays, it's different. But back then, since we were all brand new, it was a two man team. Two snipers would go out on patrol. Either a helicopter drop you off and leave you there. Or you would go with a platoon and an armored personnel carrier. There's four, squat, uh, four, four tracks going at one time, and you have to dismount, jump off the back while they disappear two or three miles away, and you're by yourself. Or we would go out on a platoon march, and then the platoon would go this way, and we would go that way. You know, it was a two man operation. It was really something there, you know, something that I, you know, and they told us that you're going to have to do this in class. So these people, these classmates, Man, you could hear them talking after training, after hours, after lunch, after breakfast. Oh, hell no, man, I ain't doing that. I'm out of here, man. You ain't getting me in there. Well, out of 46, 16 qualified, 16 passed. Out of my class, we had five classes total, total of seven, 70 snipers. So you could see why they came and gone. It was just through story, through hearsay, through training. And then after that, the hardest thing was you got to go out and kill them. Once you graduate, you got to go out and kill. And if we never did any killing, hmm, let's talk about a story to have, man. I don't know if I could ever kill, even though I had a couple kills before that, but I still, I forgot about those until we started having our reunions and they reminded me of what I did. And, oh, man, I didn't remember that. I don't remember that. And that's what I, my psychiatrist told me, because I had to see a psychiatrist there for a while. And he says, how could you forget something this important? I don't know. It just went completely blank. Anyways, I finally qualified. I had to shoot 900 meters. Uh, you get, uh, you had three. I think I believe it was three shots. You only had three shots at 900 meters. I passed everything else, and I shot the first one. I missed. Shot the second one. I missed. I only had one more chance to make it. Gramps being a professional, a gunner, he's laying to my right while I'm sitting there, and he's talking to me, explaining to me, "Take your time, relax." windage. You know, he'd make me fit on my hand and wipe it on my face so I could feel the wind. So I know the wind's coming this way or the wind's coming this way. He was telling me, I mean, he's the one that's educated me right then and there, but he was teaching me this for 20 days. 
This was my 21st day of qualification. So he's, he's, he's talking. And then the other one, Ron Allen, was the one from Portland, Oregon. He was at my feet. And he was chanting. He said, Ronnie, 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 you got it. Ronnie, Ronnie, you got it. Ronnie, all the guys on my feet, you know, pushing my head, getting my concentration. And he's telling me, take a deep breath. You got to concentrate. You got to only have one more shot. If not, I was going back to the field. If not, I mean, if I make it, I'm going to be with these guys. So I finally, boom, fired that last shot. Target goes down. Usually if target goes down, comes up, there's nothing, there's nothing. Target goes down, comes up, and there's a white spot right in the middle of it. I qualified at 900 meters. Now I became a sniper. So after that, they says, okay, you're going to go to in town, uh, in country. Uh, they call it in country R&R for going to school. Get your congratulations, a pat on the back. This is what you're going to get for doing that. Wow, that's great. You went to bunk down. And uh, we're partying for three days. Come back. Gramps already had three kills. Whoa. Ron Allen and I are in bunk towels drinking a beer. I got photos of us just sitting there drinking a beer and me staring down at the beer glass thinking. I says, hey, Ron, you know what this means? He says, no, what? He said, we got to kill people. And he says, whoa. You know, because he was a clerk typist. I convinced him to come with me. He was in Tan Ann Airstrip, and I just talking all this. He got all hyped up, and he'd come with me, but he knew how to shoot. I didn't know how to shoot. <laughs> he was an expert shooter. He became a sniper. He went to Vietnam as a clerk typist, like you guys. And, and I was in the field already once for five months, and he didn't know that. He thought I was a battalion radio operator where I came like him. But no, I already had experience in the field. So he became a sniper. He became a sniper in ramps. A 37-year-old with 17 years of military experience, he, of course, he made it with no problem. So come back, Ramps has got three kills, and now it's our turn. Ron Allen, they sent him out to somebody else, and Gramps had me with him. I couldn't shoot people to save my life, man. They sent me alone. They were going to try to split the stipers up, and I went out for almost two weeks. I couldn't kill. I just, I, I'd see people. They'd send me out there to kill them. I just couldn't do it. So they finally put me with Gramps. Gramps says, man, I says, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. So Gramps spots. Gramps were in a, uh, a, comp, a platoon sweep. And he was the first one to spot the enemy, which was a woman. And uh, we at that time, we don't know what they are. And from that distance, you just got to aim and shoot. But we know where they're coming from because we got the intelligence. The intelligence the, everything is coming from this area, going to that area, whether it be payroll, whether it be uh, maps, uh, no matter what it is. You know, they send you up because the villagers would tell us that. We would get intelligence. So Gramps got his first kill. Uh, not his first kill, but along with while I was with him, it was the first time I seen him kill because I was looking at his target before he shot it. <laughs> he shot a a female pregnant woman got two body counts in that one. So I'm thinking, oh my God. And then her daughter or her little sister that was with her started running. But she picked up what they had first. She picked up and started running with the basket. So why, why was it that important for her to pick that basket up and run if it wasn't something important at that time? And I, I, I needed to know what I was doing. And instead of shoot, 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 and Gramps is yelling at me, shoot her. Shoot her. And I did, and I couldn't shoot her. And he's screaming at me over the phone. He said, I'm going to court martial you, man. I'm sending you back. That was the enemy. You let her go. You let her go. Because they got up and they got the woman and pregnant woman, but she had no documentation. The little girl had it took off. So that night they were upset at me. Everybody was upset at me. And about two hours later, my lieutenant spots three gooks coming towards our way, about 500 meters away. I could hit a target at 500 easily. And it says, hey, Lieutenant, it says, hey, there he is right there, sniper. Now, he already felt unsure if I was going to perform. So I picked up the gun. I looked at it 500 meters away. He says, can you hit it that distance? I says, yeah, I hit you. They cross a dike. That's about 350 meters away. 300 meters away. 250 meters away. 200 meters away. I just couldn't do it. 50 meters away. Now, the lieutenant looks at me and he says, hey, sniper, if you don't take him out, he gets into our perimeter, which our perimeter, we're surrounding him. All right, we're going to end up killing each other. Oh, man, I had no choice. Aim, shot him. All I saw was a pair of feet fly up in here. 
Oh, my heart just started pounding out of my chest. And I couldn't believe it. And I'm staring. I just want to say, man, did I really kill that guy? Did I really? All of a sudden, the other two stood up. There was three of them coming. The other two stood up. And they're looking on the ground like they stepped on a booby trap right in front of me. I'm the sniper with the ultimate weapon of all. I can take them out anytime. Stood up right in front of me. And I thought, man, I can't believe this. Well, common sense. They couldn't believe it either. <laughs> so they're looking for what did this guy step on to kill him. So finally, one guy throws the body over his shoulders, and then he hands his weapon to the other one. And what do they do? Start walking at me again. Whoa, start walking right towards me again. I picked up. I couldn't believe it. Pow, I shot again. Two. I got two that night. Finally, the guy that was behind just hit the ground. He just started shooting spray in the air. And I was never in a situation like this. I panicked. I grabbed my rifle, and I started shooting back. And I'm hitting the ground with tennis. Hey, hey, hey. Sniper, he says, you, know, you can see him, he can't see you. Oh, man, sometimes it, it's got to click. <laughs> so he tells me that, and I'm thinking, oh my God, now finally I'm looking at him, I'm trying to hit him, and he's jumping up and running, and I'm saving. Finally, I took a couple shots and I missed him. Ah, I jump right over the perimeter and I go chase him. It's the middle of the night. You can't see your hand in front of your face, and I'm over here chasing this guy. And every I'd run maybe 10, 15 feet, and I'd look at my scope, see where he's running, and I'd run again, and I'd look at my scope, see where he's running. I'd chase him until he got out of sight. Now, after that, I'm thinking to myself, i got to come back to these guys. And i got a whole platoon there, 30 guys. They can't see me. The only one that can see me is the lieutenant and maybe a couple of squad leaders. Oh, man, here I'm coming back, and I'm yelling, I'm screaming, hey, sniper Voltaire coming in. Sniper Voltaire, yeah, I don't want to make sure they didn't Don't shoot me. Shoot me. <laughs> yeah, then finally the shot flares up, and they saw who it was coming. And I got a silver star. I mean, I got a bronze star with, with a V device that night for killing a captain because after they went through, you know, all this stuff, he was he was captain because of the belt. He had a VC belt on. That was it. Then after that, man, it's like playing baseball, one and more. I wanted to get as many as I could. And the reason why I felt like that was because I, I ended up, you know, being part of friendly fire on my own people. And this was the way I was getting even. So to me, it was mentally right. But it, it took its toll. You know, it took its toll after it was all over and done. How long were you a sniper for? Uh, from uh, March 15th from training to July 15th. What was it four months? March, April, May, June, July. Yeah, four months. Solid in the field. Still had my workout club. I had the lieutenant. I had everybody working out with me. So, the one night we went out, we went out on patrol. The lieutenant that I said I mentioned to you got injured. They made him a, a acting commander, company commander, and he's going out on a patrol, and. I got, there was an engineer, we were going out to fix a bridge, and because they blow up bridges all the time on us. So we're going out, I jumped on the track with the engineers on it. And the lieutenant says, hey Ron, he says, get on my track. I said, oh, come on, lieutenant. I says, you're the one they want, they don't want me, they want you. And his track looked like a, a Christmas tree, all lit up, he had antennas all over the place. So if the enemy wants somebody, who are you going to want to take? The guy that, that's riding with this guy. And I said, no, man. I said, I can't do it with that. He said, come on, man. He said, if I go, you go. Oh, that made a lot of sense. Okay. You know, all right, let's do it that way. So I jumped down from the track I was on, got on his track. Two miles out, first track, hits a 500-pound bomb, kills everybody on board. That was the one he got me off of. Wow. So he saved my life to this day. I saved your life. I said, yeah, okay. But you remember when I was a point man, I saved his life. When that was going back in the beginning again, where he made me a point man. I'm walking through on a dirt road, and I spot a little silver thing sticking out of the ground. And with the sun beating the way it's beating, there's no silver out there, not even bullet rounds or shells. You see something silver sticking out of the ground, what does that tell you? I walked up to it, I stopped the whole platoon. I says, hey, hold on. I looked down. Oh, that was a that was a detonator that was sticking up. And we're walking, and the hook got the whole platoon behind me. I says, Lieutenant. I says, what we trap? He's sitting on top of a track, maybe 50 feet, 50, 50 feet, 50 yards. I'm not sure exactly. It was a good distance behind. Him. He says, well, he, he asked me, he says, okay, disarm it. 
just arm it. <laughs> First of all, they make me an appointment I know nothing about. Just now I got to disarm a booby trap. So I grab a claymore. A claymore is about the size of this. And the, and the little thing is sticking out of the ground like this. And I put the claymore on top of it. And claymore got a 50 foot line. So I jump on the other side of the ditch. And the ditch was about six feet down. So I jumped on the other side of the ditch and I got to click our claymore trigger. I click that three times, one, two, three, boom, it blows up. It was a 500 pound bomb under there. So when my little claymore hit that 500 pound bomb, it made a crater about the size of this room and the dust went up about 30, 40 feet in the air. Pure dust, all rolled. Finally it settled. You couldn't see anything for, oh man, about a minute, two minutes, three minutes maybe, maybe four. <laughs> Finally it settled and I look up at the lieutenant and I'm looking at him, and he's looking down at me. You ever see L. Jolson? Uh, the old movies, L. Jolson, where the white guy paints himself yeah. black? The lieutenant had, <laughs> after the dust settled, he shook his head, he opened his eyes, all you saw was the white of his <laughs> eyes and the white of his lips. Man, I laughed so hard. He says, hey, I told you to disarm and not blow the road up. <laughs> I said, well, you know, that's the only thing I knew. Do what you got to do. So then after that, uh, our last kill, I was a sniper. We had a last kill. There's a lot more kills in between, but the last one was a touchy one. This is uh, my sniper partner, Ellen from Portland. We spotted, he spotted in, in, in Vietnam. Two snipers are uh, whoever spots the target and becomes a shooter, and the second one becomes a spotter. That's just the way it was. So he spots this target. He aims and uh, he shoots. Target goes down, boom. And we're sitting there checking out and looking around to make sure we're okay. All of a sudden, the target sits up. And I'm standing here. I'm his spotter. I could see that bullet leave his gun. I could see that bullet hit that target. Target sits back up. And he says, Ron, I know I hit it. It's okay. So he aimed again. Shot it again. Boom. The target hits the ground. I mean, when you hit a fly, you swat a fly, you know you got the fly. He's, he hit her. He hit the target. Went down again. Finally, we waited about another minute or two. Target got back up again. I said, man, we're sitting there freaking out because I know he's hitting it because I can see it. He shot her again, her, because we found out it was a female. He shot the target again. Target went down. Finally, it gets up again. Bad time, I says, Ron, let me shoot. He said, man, I, I, all right, don't worry about it. Let me shoot, let me shoot. Boom, shot it, that was it. Didn't get back up. So we spotted a bush behind where the target was at. So we went in straight line from where we were at in the ground to the bush, and we had to see what the record was behind us. So we can line it up to make sure we're going down the right pass. Um, daybreak broke in about 20 minutes. We're going out there to get it. Now the whole company is going out. And we're walking directly where the target hit. We finally got to where the target, we thought the target was, it, was the, it wasn't there. The target was spotted 200 feet to, or 200 meters to our right. And the story behind that is, you know, whoever we shot, picked up the body, changed the clothes, dragged it, and buried it under nipple pot, and they just happened to find it. And he says, hey, these snipers, got a body over here. Went over to it and looked at it, and we saw the body was had a white blouse. And he says, man. And then Ron said, that's not it. That's not our target. That's a female. We didn't shoot that. And I look closely and you can see little tricks of blood coming out of that white blouse, fresh blood. And I says, hey man, I said, go down there and check that out, man. Something's not right. He goes down, he rips the blouse open. And he says, wow, check those tits out. I said, oh man. I says, the dirty bullet holes on there. <laughs> he spotted four bullet holes. Grazed the stomach, knocked the elbow off, grazed the neck and the direct hit was right through the ribs out the other side. So, you know, hitting it in the ribs completely, if that was it, it was gone. But he he shot it three times, and I shot it once. So, in the morning, they come up and they say, hey, we're looking for sniper ball, you know, sniper Ron. And Ron Allen happened to be there when they said that. And he says, why, what do you want him for? Uh, he says, I'm Ron. He said, well, you're going home. He said, we come to get you. He says, uh, your time to go home. Oh, man, he jumped for joy. He was going crazy, and I'm over here talking to my friends. He comes running up to me, and he says, Ryan, he says, man, we're going home. 
He said, we're going. I said, what do you mean we're going home? He says, yeah, he just told me, you know, Stamper Ryan's going home. I said, what? Which Stamper Ryan? I'm Ryan Baltier. You're Ryan Allen. Which one? He said, we're both going home. I said, oh, okay. So I didn't think anything of it. So they says, hey, do, uh, you want us to take you home, take you by Commodore, or do you want to wait for the chapters to come out and get you? Because they want to get you out of the field. When you're time to go, they come and get you. And we were snipers, so we were special. So they had to come to get us out by chopper if that's what we wanted. I didn't want to stick around because I didn't know how long the chopper was going to take. I said, no, we'll take the convoy. Oh, my God, that was the worst thing I could have said on my last day there. Convoy, we got roadblock, we got ambushed, we got sniped at, we got, <laughs> oh, my God. When I knew I was going home and I'm thinking of this and I'm seeing this and when I knew I could have waited maybe a couple hours and flown home on a chopper, oh, it was stressful. That was stressful, but anyway, three days later I go home, and I end up being coming home. And uh, I came home five weeks early. My fiance didn't know that, so I come home, uh, go looking for her. And uh, her roommate, she lived on the north side of Chicago on the third floor. Her roommate said, who are you? And I told her I was. So how do I know you? I said, you don't, but that's who I am. And I says, well, where's, where's my girl at? She says, oh. Uh, uh, I said, where's she at? Uh, what time she get off work? Oh, five o'clock. Oh, okay, five o'clock. I should be coming home. Yeah, but uh, what? She didn't want to tell me. I said, okay. So I waited a little bit. And she says, I got some Jack Daniels. You want to drink? I try. I don't drink, but yeah, why not? So I'm drinking. Finally, six o'clock comes around. So what time? You said she gets off at five. She's usually home at five thirty. Well, sometimes her friend will take her out to dinner. I said, her friend? Who's her friend? And she gave me his name. And I remembered it because she was writing me, telling him that this guy wants to take her to breakfast. And I said, what are you, nuts? We're engaged. This guy, same guy wants to take her to lunch? I said, you got to be crazy. But this guy wants to take her to dinner. That was the last time I wrote because I came home early. <laughs> now, I'm waiting for her. Eight o'clock comes around. Nothing. Nine o'clock comes around. Ten o'clock comes around. Eleven o'clock comes. Now she's telling me sometimes she don't get home. So eleven or twelve. Oh, okay. Twelve o'clock comes around. Sometimes she don't come home till five thirty in the morning. Oh man, she's getting me drunk on Jack Daniels, telling me this story. Now I don't need to hear this. Finally, I'm out there on the balcony and I'm watching all these cars come down the alley and I went running down. I said, "Where does he live? He lives somewhere down there in the alley. He lives in the basement, you know, from his mother's house." Man, at by 2 o'clock in the morning, I was drunk. <laughs> Found myself walking down the alley and beating on basement doors. You know, I said, are you sure? I came back after nobody answered. They were vacant. Nobody slept in the basement back then. Come back finally about 5.30. I'm still outside. I see her get out of this little car. I remember she had blonde hair. Real pretty girl. But she had a rabbit coat on, a white rabbit coat. I'm thinking, I don't remember buying her that. Remember the guy getting out, walk around the car, open the door and let her out? Oh, man, I haven't done that in a long time, man. <laughs> I said, what's going on here? Something's wrong. So I figured, well, I was in the NAM that long. And I did some things in NAM too, you know, being a, you know, I did my thing, so I was going to understand, let it go. I go downstairs, and finally I see, I, I just couldn't take it, especially being drunk. I go running down three flights of stairs and I jump off the last landing. Didn't even bother running down and I jumped off it. <laughs> Landed in front of her and she looks at me in, in shock. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? I got five weeks early out and you're asking me what am I? Who's he? And he turns and he looks at me and says, hey, you better be cool, calm, and collected. Oh, man, it's like pulling the leash off a pit bull. Man, I went running after him. She got in the way. She was like, she's going to stop me. He had this new rabbit coat, white rabbit coat. I grabbed her by her sleeves and I threw her into these empty. We had steel garbage cans back then. They were empty. It sounded like she was playing the drums when I threw her into them. But I had her sleeves in my hand. <laughs> her sleeves came off. So I went running around there. This guy looked at me and he was telling her before. I even come around, oh yeah, I used to box, I'm on soccer, I work out. He's eight years older than her, ten years older. He's all this, he's super, super gym. I said, okay, so after that, he sees me running after him. He looked like Fred Flintstone running on gravel. He couldn't even get away quick enough. <laughs> all you saw was his feet just flapping and he wasn't moving. 
but he still got into the car. When he got in the car, by that time I got to the car, pulled the door open, jumped in and started punching him because I was a wrestler. I used to do a lot of wrestling. I'm now one of them, I'm hitting him with my head. I'm doing everything because I'm smaller. I'm five, three and a half. He's six foot, so I had the leverage. <laughs> Finally, she opens the door up, starts screaming. I kicked him out. He was already worn out. Kicked him out. I jumped up, kicked him in his head. She jumped on my neck and screaming in my ear, telling me, stop, stop, you're going to kill him, you're going to kill him. I looked down and I says, well, what am I doing? Uh, I let it be. And that was it. I just let it, I let it go. And it didn't work out after that. I imagine. After that, it didn't work out. Then I, I go to Fort Hood. Now, this is when I first got home. I go to Fort Hood. I had seven months left to do. On December, no, on August 24th or 23rd, my father dies of pneumonia at the VA hospital. And you were home I just now. got home. I had I just went to Fort Hood, Texas. I might, might have been there a week or two. And they tell me that my father died. He only went in there for a cyst on the back. He was a barber. He had a cyst on the back of his neck. He wanted to take it off because he was always self-conscious about it. Well, they cut it off and he dies at the VA. They had him in the hall. And back then, VA was nothing like it is today. So he dies. And my brother, he's in college. He gets shot in the hip by a cop, Chicago cop, for breaking into houses on, on, in, in a, a 55th in Harlem, around that area. And the cops held him down. By the time they got him to the hospital, no, but if you didn't sign for any medical attention, you didn't get it. By the time my mother got there to sign, he bled to death. Was he younger than you? He was 19. I was 21. Or 22. I turned 22 in Vietnam. So he died. His father died two months after that. Good guy. We're both of them, his father and my father, World War II vets. He dies of cancer, never knowing what happened to his son at the age of 50. Then my fiance finally, we split totally. Didn't want anything to do with her. And then I met a girl. Then I, luckily, I got into wrestling. I ended up taking my mind off a lot of things because I love wrestling anyways and I got a scholarship out of it. I met a girl that was on a basketball team and that lasted about maybe six weeks. She ended up taking off with another female nurse. <laughs> <laughs> so like my book says, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have had no luck. I would like to look at your book. Yeah. And we've gone over an hour. So is there any final thoughts or anything final you'd like to say before we wrap it up? Uh, give me a, a hint. What is it that you might want to hear? Whatever about the you Vietnam? want to say. Okay, well, or how you feel about it. It's oh, entirely up to that's you. That's the reason why I volunteered to become a uh, service officer. I retired as a general contractor and I just couldn't take it sitting home doing nothing. So I volunteered to become a service officer to help veterans. A lot of people that I knew had problems and lived a bad life and died young from alcoholism, drugs, personal friends of mine. And people being a service officer, I met a lot of other people. And not only that, I do karaoke as well. And I meet, meet a lot of people. And several of them that I know, two of them personally committed suicide. And, you know, I, I want to help veterans. And if this can help a veteran, to let them know what I did in the military, how I got over it when I got, well, did I, how did I get over it? It was getting a job. You know, when I first come out of Viet Vietnam, I went on to college. And if I didn't have wrestling, I probably would not have done my two years of college. But then I ended up getting a girl pregnant, so I had to drop out. And uh, if I didn't have construction, hard labor, my mind off of that, and I became a businessman where I can concentrate on working, on creating, on achieving something. And if I didn't have that, I probably would have been an alcoholic doing drugs, probably would have been dead a long time ago, like my friends were. So what you have to do when you come out of the military, you got to keep your mind occupied. You're not the only one that went through it. Look what I went through. Not only did I you know, see a lot of casualties during my time there, I came home and it was casualties. And I'm still in the service. I lost all those people. And people say to me, how could you how could you do it? It was constantly moving, 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 thinking, thinking. 
But nowadays, there's no jobs. So you see already, so that's a big problem that we have right now. Hopefully, we can get somebody that's going to be coming into this presidency that's going to create jobs. And Trump looks like he might be the one because he's a businessman and he knows it's not politics, it's business. You know, politicians, I ran for alderman, I ran for state senator, and I seen the way all these guys operate, and I seen what I had to go through, and I seen how they all stiffed me when I was running up against them as a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you some horror stories on what they did to me, and I got videos, I got pictures, and every time I try to complain about it, I would call DC, I mean Chicago, and say, hey man, this guy's got cookies at the voting polls with his picture and his name on there. And they says, how do you know? I said, I got pictures of it. You know, you can go to jail for doing that. <laughs> I can go to jail for it. He's not even supposed to be any 100 feet away from the polling place. Right. Oh, unbelievable, unbelievable. But I tried it. Then I tried Senator. I said, let me see, this Senator, I don't know about him. So I tried to be the Senator. He did the same thing. I got two bowlings, two readings. One of the polls where I got, uh, I can't remember the numbers, they were so 980 votes came in. Uh, the, the, the standing senator got 320. There's only two of us. And another one, 420. The standing senator only got 150. And you know how many votes I ended up getting? Those two, if you add up what those two were, it was the only numbers I got. And he got 45,000 votes. <laughs> Whoa. And then they didn't give me the results till three months, to, no, uh, um, um, one month and two weeks later. Oh my. Yeah, they were fixing the books or cooking the books, whatever they were doing, making a little bit. That's when I said, uh uh, I'm out of here. So, so now you try to stay focused on helping I'm focused, the veterans. Yeah, I'm staying back with the veterans, trying to help. And that's how I caught this Bell's policy I was telling you about. I've had it for two and a half years now. And uh, it's because I, well, the only thing I did wrong was when I gave my business card, it said 24 seven. Oh. Oof, they were calling me 24 seven. And I had no rest and I wanted to help them. Yeah. And I bent over backwards trying to help them. I housed them at my house, I fed them. Mm -hmm. I took care of them. And, you know, I still care about them, but you know, it's not just me that's gotta take care of them. I mean, we all got to take care of these veterans. These veterans all need help. I'm pretty lucky to be where I'm at, you know. I'm not hurting like they are, and a lot of them are hurting really bad. And the thing that gets me, we got these new veterans that are coming out right now. Oh, oh, we're going to give them 100%. We're going to take care of them. We're going to give them 100%. You know, 100% is like $3,000. $3,000 divided by four weeks. How much, how, what could he do per week? And he's a handicap. Look at the help he's got. He needs driving. He needs food. He needs housing. And 750 bucks is going to take care of him? No way. And you think when Obama was running the first time, they told me at the VA that they were going to double our benefits. In other words, if I was getting 3000 I was going to get 6000 If the other people were going to get 400 they're going to get 800 That never happened. No, it was just something that was thrown out there so us veterans can vote for this guy. Right. Oh. So if Trump says he wants to help veterans, hey, they can't live on $3,000 a month. There's no way a veteran with 100% disability, and these guys, they get that 100% aren't lying. You know, because the way there's, it's hard to get benefits. So if you do get it, you're pulling teeth. <laughs> yeah, and it shouldn't be that. You shouldn't be like that. You know, you need a competent uh, evaluator that can come out and really evaluate. Did this guy really got a problem or not? Right. First of all, where did he go? What did he do? Look what I did. Was I entitled to benefits? I got blown up. And when I got blown up, I had to take care of myself. You know, if I wasn't self-employed, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made it. But since I was self-employed, I took care of myself. I had to pay for my own insurance. I did everything. I went and I had x-rays, I, uh, I had an operation, I had everything done on my legs, my knees, everything. And if, if I didn't have the money to do it or the insurance to do it, I couldn't have got it done. Not relying on the VA. I stopped going to the VA because the doctor told me after my second divorce, I mean, not doctor, I'm sorry, the judge after my second divorce says, you know, this is your second divorce. I, I don't really, I didn't want to lose my first one, but I was in college and she was a girlfriend. This one I loved. I really don't want to let her go. 
He said, well, then you got to see a psychiatrist. I didn't have any money for a psychiatrist. So I went to the VA. And I go to the VA, and VA says, uh, the nurse says, well, what's the problem? I said, man, I, I can't stand Chinese food. I can't, you know, I, I kept going back to that, man, because it was still fresh in my mind. I just can't stand to look at gooks. I look at a child. I lived in an area where there were no Chinese people. So when I seen one, right away, I'm thinking of Vietnam. And then when I was drinking, oh, it even got worse. And my second wife would be screaming at me, yelling at me, trying to get me out from underneath the truck. She said, come on. I said, no, they're coming. Get over here. And I'm trying to pull her down and she's pregnant. So, you know, I, I didn't realize that. And just So I told the judge I want to keep her. Just okay, go to a psychiatrist. I go to VA Heinz. I tell the nurse what I just told you about the, the Orientals. I don't feel that way now. I did then. And uh, she sends me to a psychiatrist. He's looking out the window in this big old chair behind me. I come walking in. And I'm, I'm ready to spill my guts out. I already told it to the nurse. I want to tell this guy. Is there something wrong with me? What's the problem? What could I do to get over it? All of a sudden, the chair turns around. There's a little gook sitting there, a little doctor, a little psychiatrist, a little Chinese psychiatrist. <laughs> oh, whatever he was. I don't know. Orient. Can I help you? Oh, man. He said, what's your problem? I said, well, I didn't know what to say to him, man. He confronted me dead on. You know, what am I supposed to say? I don't know, man. I keep thinking of being that. What do you mean you think of being that? He's yelling at me because I'm thinking of it. I said, okay, well, he sends me to an alcoholic ward. Do you drink? Well, no, not at all. Look at me. Do I look like I drink? <laughs> you know, I'm telling you right now, look at me now physically. Do I look like an alcoholic? No. At 68 years of age, I'm very healthy because I don't drink. I don't do this. I'm not an alcoholic. I've seen alcoholics all my life. <laughs> but back then, to try to convince someone, I wasn't an alcoholic. I just had a problem. I didn't know what the problem was. And the problem was Vietnam. Not that I was crazy. I was emotional. I couldn't tell my story without crying. Anywhere I'd be, if I'm in a bar, if I'm in a restaurant, another vet comes up to me and asks me about what I did. I avoided this. Well, we end up killing our own. I avoided that. And then when I did get to that, I'd fall apart. But going to, to the VA, the psychiatrist, and these were good people. Like I say, they were Americans. They weren't Orientals. And the American doctors and nurses understood what I was talking about because one of them was a lieutenant. And he was a very good guy. He's in California right now. But he helped me a lot. And then my, my partner in business, he was also a Vietnam vet. He helped me a lot. So you, you need help. There's no way you can come out of a battle war scar zone and expect just to walk normal. It's not going to happen. You have to be there to be with them. And, and what helps is money. Oh, don't let anybody kid you. Look how the rich are living. Look how the poor are living. Look how the mentally disturbed veterans like I, look how we have, well, I'm, I'm not doing bad, but how others have to live. And the only way you can get them out of that, give them a little more money. Right. Make them live a little more comfortably. That's all. That's pretty much it. Well, I would like to thank you very much for your time today and sharing all your stories with us. And I'd also like to sincerely thank you for your service. And thank you to our court reporter, Jacqueline, today. And that will conclude our interview with okay. Mr. Do I get to see this before you? Well, you know, is anybody going to see this? Or you I? will get a copy of this. Oh. Yes, okay. you will.